floor. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks so much for joining this, uh, joining us this evening for uh, another um, science speaker series. Um, it's like to have you all here and to um, have our speaker, Dr. Lauren Corley is with us. Um, before I introduce her, I'm gonna share my screen with you and just show you all of the upcoming um, speaker series events we have in the next few months. We've got a pretty awesome lineup um, over the next few months. And so I definitely encourage you to um, come back and check out these other speakers. Um, as you might already know, this year we're focusing on telescopes and discoveries that have the potential to change our understanding of the cosmos. So we're gonna be looking at um, several different um, telescopes and really interesting um, discoveries over the next few months. Um, and as always, um, a special shout out to all of the sponsors um, to the speaker series, um, and especially the Wyoming Stargazing Board of Directors for all the work they do um, behind the scenes, um, especially Liz Mosley and, and everybody else who comes together to make these programs possible. We really appreciate all of your support and uh, for all of you for uh, being here tonight, um, because without you, we, um, we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, so thanks so much for joining us again. Um, as some of you know, uh, after the presentation, we are gonna have our door prizes and our raffle drawings. So um, everyone who's here is entered into the um, door prizes. Um, tonight, we've got one of the few remaining eclipse coins from the 2017 uh, total solar eclipse. So they're, there are only about 20 of these left that we have. So we're gonna give one of them away tonight. It, they're functional eclipse coins. We actually had them made with a hole in the center to project the eclipse onto the ground. So you can use these for any uh, upcoming uh, partial mm -hmm. or total solar eclipses. Uh, and then we've got one of the eclipse stickers. Um, we've got uh, a NASA sticker and another um, fun sticker made by some local artists. By Holly Sage Art, and then we'll also um, give one of the astrophotography prints away, um, made by one of our board members, Mike Adler, who is uh, on the call tonight. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Yeah. Hi there. And then, um, uh, for those of you who actually purchased raffle tickets, we'll also do a drawing for another one of Mike's prints at the end. So definitely uh, stick around uh, for those door prizes and raffle prizes at the end. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening. Um, Dr. Lauren Corleys is the Deputy Director of Education and Public Outreach at the Vera Rubin Observatory. And she's gonna tell you um, all about the um, amazing work that the um, Large Synaptic Survey Telescope um, is going to um, be doing once it comes online. Um, and uh, it should be um, a very, very um, exciting presentation. So with that, I will uh, hand it over to Dr. Corley's. Great, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Yeah, uh, I'm going to mute us, hold on. Remember to share my sound and hit play. Okay, thank you everyone for coming tonight. It's really great to have this opportunity to speak with you all. I think this is one of my favorite parts about being in quarantine and having to do all of these things online is that I get to be in different places um, and get to speak with all these different types of people. So thank you very much for coming. Um, so as was mentioned, I'm going to introduce to you tonight the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Um, so it's an observatory that's still under construction as you can sort of guess from this picture. Um, this picture is definitely old though, so you can play along and try and guess when was the picture taken given when I show them in my slides based off how well constructed this dome is or not. Um, and I'm gonna explain my tagline here of the universe in action coming soon. Um, so to get started, I wanna show a video that our team made that sort of um, sets up what is the observatory, what is it trying to do, and it does it in this 
really dramatic and fun way, which I enjoy showing off. So hopefully the sound works. The night sky, our window to the universe beyond, immense, mysterious, powerful, quietly beautiful, cosmic events at the edge of our imagination unfold in the darkness, ready to be discovered. When we look at the night sky, we see into the past. Untold stories carried through space by light, the great historian of the cosmos. Technology has evolved over centuries, allowing us to look farther to the edge of our horizon. We invented telescopes to explore and cameras to capture these traveling messages. Yet the changing cosmos remains unseen. A new telescope opens its eye and captures it all. The objects that move and those that flash. Even those we cannot see with our eyes. Every few nights it covers the sky, finding all that has changed. And within minutes, new glimmers of activity are carried around the Earth to anyone waiting to explore them. What will you discover that no one has seen before? It's time to find out. Okay, um, so I like to open with that video because it does a really good job of showing what the observatory is, what it's trying to do, and all the things we're going to learn as a result of that. And that's pretty much the outline of the talk that I'm going to give today. So I want to tell you a bit more about what is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory and the LSST. Um, so we're still in construction and we're building this observatory that is pretty unique and different from others that have come before both in how it's been constructed um, and also what it's been designed to do. Um, and then after that, I'm gonna talk a bit about what was the Rubin Observatory designed to accomplish? Um, so what science questions are we trying to answer that ultimately drive why we're building the telescope the way that we are? And then finally, I wanna end a little bit with what my team is doing, education and public outreach and what we're planning for the public in terms of how you all can interact with the observatory in the future. Um, so just some uh, jargon to get started, some words I'm going to be using throughout the talk. And really, if you're going to take away anything from everything that I'm going to say, this is probably the most important slide. Um, so the Vera C. Rubin Observatory is conducting the legacy survey of space and time. And so to break that down a little bit more, um, the observatory, if I had to set, summarize it in a single sentence, is that it's the biggest digital camera in the world suspended above an 8.4 meter diameter mirror, so a huge mirror, that takes a single image the size of 40 full moons at incredible resolution. So it's really this advancement in terms of the kinds of technology that we're using for the telescope. And then ultimately the survey that it's conducting is an effort to image the entire southern sky roughly every three nights for 10 years um, for an unprecedented exploration of the universe in action. So there is the observatory, which is conducting the survey, and that's going to answer all the scientific questions that people are posing. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit just about Vera C. Rubin. Um, so we recently were named after her about a year ago now. Um, we were talking about before this, um, arguing for influential astronomers throughout history, and Vera Rubin was definitely one of those. Um, she made essential contributions that influenced the entire science community, and in particular, our study and understanding of dark matter, um, which I'll talk about later in the talk. Um, I also find her really inspirational just in how she used state-of-the-art technology and new ways to answer exciting scientific questions. 
And so what new sorts of ways do we, can we build, have they built to look at the sky and what does that actually enable us to learn about the universe? Uh, and then finally, she was also an advocate for women and more inclusivity in science, which are also values that the observatory holds and is uh, working towards achieving in the future and now. Okay, so what is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory? Uh, and before I get into exactly what, it's always fun to start with where is the, Rubin, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory? Um, so the construction project um, is mostly based in the US. That's where most of the scientists and the staff are. Um, but there are a large fraction of us down in Chile where the telescope is actually being constructed. Um, and so you can see a picture of the globe um, in Chile where the telescope is. The closest town to the telescope is called La Serena uh, and the port is Coquimbo. So because most of us are based in North America, that's actually where most of the pieces of the telescope are being built. And then they get shipped down to South America where they arrive in Coquimbo. And then we have to drive them up this highway to the top of a mountain called Cerro Pachon where the telescope actually sits on top of the mountain. Um, and you can see, again, you can like guess the timeline with this picture of the dome. This is some of my teammates uh, up there, I think about two years ago now, um, where you can see it's being built in this very dry climate. Um, so what does the telescope actually look like? What will it look like? What is it starting to look like? Which is the most exciting thing. Um, so the actual design of the telescope is really unique um, in how it's trying to capture light from the universe. And so what it's doing is on the left, it sort of shows how the light enters and bounces through the telescope before finally making it into the camera. Um, so light comes down from the sky and it hits the big mirror at the bottom which isn't actually a single mirror, it's two mirrors in a single piece of, it's not glass, but a single structure. Um, so you can see the outer bigger mirror, it bounces up to a secondary mirror, back down to that same surface, but with a different curve there in the center, and then up into the camera. So the camera, which is huge, actually hangs above the whole primary mirror. Um, and so that's sort of like what the, what the glass looks like, what the optics look like. Um, and then on the right, it's showing diagrams of what the fully assembled telescope will look like at the end of construction. Um, so at the top there, you can see a sort of top-down look. You can look into it. You can see that primary mirror at the bottom. And then I really like this edge-on view because it also helps uh, highlight how our telescope is a little bit different and that it's very squat. It's very compact, this telescope. Um, and that was intentional because what we're trying to do is look at a lot of the sky really quickly and so that involves having to move the telescope really frequently. Um, and so when it's short and compact like this, it's a lot easier to move it faster, but not only just to move it, but to stop it is actually very important too. So you need to move, get to a new position. And if the telescope is shaking a little bit, it's a massive structure. It needs to be completely still in order to be able to take the next picture of the sky. And so having this compact structure is what enables us to do the survey that we want to do. Um, sometimes it's easy to forget that this telescope is actually being built because most of us don't get to see it. Um, a lot of the team is based in Tucson, Arizona. Um, but I was lucky enough that when I started this job back in October 2018, that big primary tertiary mirror was actually in Arizona. There's a big mirror lab at the university um, where they were doing the final polishing of the mirror. Um, and so we got to actually go and see it. And like, yes, it does exist. It's really happening. The thing is being built. Uh, and then this is a picture of after they had boxed it all up and are moving it in order to be able to ship it down to Chile. And so you can get a sense of the size. This is one of the roads that goes through the university and it takes up like, the whole road. Um, and it's difficult to move something this big that far to the point where now the size of the mirror that we're building for use on top of the mountain where LSST will be is um, actually just the size of the infrastructure that supports the roads in general. Um, so this was a very uh, tense moment where we had to make sure that the telescope would actually fit through this tunnel in order to be able to make it up to the top of the mountain. And so you can see this picture of he's, yes, it is very much center. Please continue on. The mirror is going to be fine. Um, and you can see pictures that are continuing to drive it up the mountain. And right now the telescope, or this big uh, primary mirror is on top of the mountain in the warehouse there waiting to be put into the full telescope mount. Um, that's currently under construction. They're building the mount that's actually going to hold all of these optics pieces as well as the camera. And just last week, actually, there, we had a big milestone where they're building this mount um, 
and they were able to put one of the big top pieces uh, into place. And so they took a video of that, which I also really like. Um, it also has slightly dramatic music. Um, so this, the top end assembly is what they're calling it. And so you'll see that it starts. Um, there's this, so it looks like a big crane. There's an even bigger crane here, this giant red one that's actually bigger than the entire dome structure, which now has all of its cladding. So you can get a sense of how much more complete it is, which is exciting. And this is that top end of the telescope mount being lifted by the giant crane and moved into the dome and guided into place as the top part of the mount of the telescope. Um, and so it's just, I can't imagine how nervous they all were to do this. At some one point, the video points out that like they did all of this in one day, but it took them months to plan this lift and this move. Um, and it's just really amazing to watch. I'm gonna give it a little bit more time. So person for scale and you can see him guiding it into place on top of the rest of the telescope mount assembly. Um, so this full video is on our social media accounts. And if you want to watch it in its entirety, I could also send everyone the link. Um, but this part actually slightly gives me vertigo. So I'm gonna move on to the next part of my talk. Um, which is about the camera. Um, so the, the telescope itself is great, the mirrors are great, but if we're collecting a lot of light but not capturing any of the light, then we're not really doing what we're trying to set out to do. And so part of what's so powerful about our observatory and our telescope is the camera that we're actually using to observe and collect the light. Um, so I mentioned it's the biggest digital camera in the world. Um, so what you're seeing on the left here is what we call the focal plane. So it's act the actual CCDs that will capture the light that's collected by the telescope. Um, the CCDs are pretty similar to what's like in your phone or in your digital camera. Um, there's just a lot more of them and they're all much more sensitive with higher resolution in a single space. Uh, in the upper right, you can see the container for the whole camera, again, with people in the clean room for scale of just exactly how big it is. It's roughly the size of a small car. Um, and there's still, at this point, a lot of it's been assembled, but they're still working on finishing up some of the final details of the camera. Um, and for scale, the way that the camera is built, um, so you can see each of these little squares maybe um, on the left and also represented graphically on the right. So each square is itself a CCD. And so then they're arranged into groups of nine in this three by three pattern, and that's referred to as a raft. Um, so you can see one of these rafts on the left here on a table. So a raft itself is already quite large. Um, and then they put 21 of them together in this pattern to make up the full image that the telescope will capture. And what you're seeing in, on the right is a picture, a size of the full moon. Um, so this is when we say we can fit 40 full moons in a single one of our pictures. They're absolutely enormous. So the individual images that the telescope will be taking. Um, and so a big accomplishment within this year, like a few months ago now, was actually assembling this focal plane. And so what this video is going to show is how they're taking each one of these individual rafts, attaching it where it belongs into the camera, and then actually lifting it up into position to be used by the telescope. Um, and so you can see everyone in their intensely clean room conditions where the camera needs to be in pristine condition for it to operate the way that we want it to. Um, and a lot of this was the work of weeks being captured here to make sure all of these were attached and fitting in exactly into place the way that they need to. Um, and it's just really, I'm always amazed by the precision at which all of these engineering tasks happen. And so now it's complete. All of the CCD rafts are in place and it's other, port, other components of the camera like how are we keeping it cool and making sure everything is attached together in order to be able to ship down to Chile. Um, so this, this, each picture has the most pixels in a single image that a camera can take. So it's not just the actual size on the sky that makes the images so large, it's the actual number of pixels and the resolution that we can have in each image. That's just absolutely enormous. Um, and so they were testing that the camera actually works the way that it's supposed to. 
Um, and so they set up a little pinhole camera and we're taking pictures of a bunch of different things. And the picture of this head of Romanesco was particularly popular. Um, it's really fun because of the fractal nature of the vegetable. You can see exactly how much detail that the images can go into that the telescope will be able to take. Um, and I'm a personal fan of some of the other pictures that they took, which was a picture of a picture of Vera Rubin looking at a picture, which I just deeply enjoy. Um, and then also a picture of a bunch of the different people who contributed to actually building the camera up on the top there. Okay, so that's the infrastructure of the observatory. That's the big pieces that we're actually constructing in order to be able to conduct a survey. Um, so I wanted to take a moment here to check in and see if there are any questions before I move on to talking about what actually is the legacy survey of space and time. Yeah, so um, this is Mike Adler. Uh, so what is the time schedule on, on the completion of the observatory? Yeah, I'll mention it later. Um, but okay. I mean, but in general, I mean, the upshot is, is we were on track to be done by October of 2022 was the original timeline. Um, and all of that's been sort of uh, thrown in, like it's been affected by the global pandemic, unfortunately. So right now we're estimating a delay of about six to 12 months, um, nice. but that all is just going to keep depending on how all this plays out eventually, so. What's the, what's the elevation of the uh, mountain that the observatory is on? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know the exact height, so I don't want to quote you a wrong number, um, but I know it's it's high, but it's not as high as, say, ALMA, which is maybe a telescope you've heard of. That's still at a higher elevation yet, so. Um, so it's not the highest, but it's definitely up there in the mountains. Um, this is Deborah Brand. Thank I, you. Yeah. I, uh, there was a piece on the radio on Science Friday today about the Arizona mirror lab um, that they're making um, uh, pieces of a, like a, a 70 meter across mirror for a future telescope. This is, um, so Arizona has come to uh, specialize in this? Uh, yeah, it's definitely, um they're among the best institutions in the world for making these sort of mirror surfaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually really interesting because you would never even know that the mirror lab was there because it's actually underneath the big football stadium at the university. And so you think yeah. you're just going to the football stadium, but in actuality, <laughs> there's a mirror lab in the basement. <laughs> yeah, they mentioned that and, yeah. and pouring the glass, which is essentially Pyrex for the mirrors. Uh, uh, it, it as they spin to distribute yeah, it, that's right? right? Yeah, yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah, you're trying to, there's a bunch of steps and I don't know all of the steps involved, but yeah, you're gonna try and cast the initial surface of the mirror. You want it to be curved in a certain way to focus the light. Um, so you'll mm -hmm. do that initial casting and then you're gonna wanna polish the surface um, mm -hmm. because the light that in particular our telescope is trying to detect, for example, is optical, which has a very short wavelength. And so the surface of your mirror needs to be exactly perfect. That way that light gets reflected correctly. Um, so there's a really, it has to be very precise. Um, and we got a tour through that um, mirror lab many, many years ago. It was so cool. Yeah. Um, and that is a mm. difference about our telescope is that it is that primary tertiary mirror. It's two mirrors, but it is still one big piece. It's one, one mirror. Um, as opposed mm. to the really large telescopes. I think I even saw on your schedule, you're gonna have a talk from the extremely large telescope. Those ones are so big that they're actually segmented. There's different mirror segments that they piece together to form the one surface. Mm. Um, JWST also does this too, the James Webb Space Telescope. So mm. for them, it's because they need to fit in a rocket. <laughs> um, for the ones on the ground, the really large ones, just because they're so big, it actually becomes challenging. How do you move something that large? So. Um, another question, this is Mike again. Uh, yeah. what's, what are the wavelengths that this telescope is going, or the camera is going to be re uh, um, uh, responsive to? Uh, yeah, is so it, it goes, basically yeah. optical or does it get into the infrared or? Yeah, so it's primarily in the optical, but we do dip on one end into the near ultraviolet and on the other into the near infrared. 
so we do extend a bit out past the optical, but not too far. So okay. right. yeah. So, but there are six six filters for the telescope. One of which includes a little bit of the UV, and then a little bit further into the IR. Okay, thanks for the questions, everyone. Um, so now I'm excited to tell you not just what we built, but what we're going to do with it. Um, so the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, which is us keeping around our old name of LSST, um, has three main properties that really drive the design of the telescope. Um, so the first one is that we want the survey to be wide. Uh, and so we mean a few things by wide. So first is each individual picture is large. Um, so I mentioned it was the most detailed, the biggest picture. So it's 60,000 pixels across for something like a 3.5 degree field of view. So it's very big. Um, and the goal is that we really want to be able to actually image the entirety of the southern sky. Um, and you can do that more effectively if you're taking bigger pictures of the sky. There's just fewer times you need to actually use the camera. Um, so the pictures have Three, over 3,000 megapixels. So there's over a billion pixels in each image that the telescope takes. Um, right now it's set up to take a picture every 30 seconds, I believe is the current survey design. So it'll take a picture for 30 seconds, take another one of the same patch of sky, and then move on to a new position and take more pictures throughout the whole night. Uh, and the pictures are so big, there's so many pixels. If you wanted to print out a single image at a standard sort of high resolution, you need a 70 by 70 foot piece of paper and two tennis courts to lay it out on. There are just an, ex an extreme amount of pixels in each image. Um, the, other, uh, and the next component of the survey that we want is for it to be fast. Um, so it's great that we can take these big pictures, but to really be able to cover as much of the sky as we want, I was saying we're taking a picture every 30 seconds and we wanna, so that's where the fast comes in. The more pictures you can take a night, more of the sky you get to cover. Um, and what I found really interesting when I first started using, working for the observatory is that I was like, oh, right, we're taking a survey. And so, you know, you point your telescope and then you move down the sky and then you move over and then you move back up. You would do this sort of like orderly pattern of how you would survey the sky. Um, that's not really how they do it at all. Um, so there's a whole team of people who are working out how to best optimize which part of the sky the telescope is looking at at any given time and where it's going to go to next. So they can plan out the whole night of observing in advance. Um, and they're taking into consideration things like, where is the moon? Um, the moon is bright. It makes it harder to see deeper into images because of how much light it reflects. So we try not to look at the moon. Um, it'll account for things like looking straight up through the atmosphere is better. There's less atmosphere that you're looking through for your images. So the more up you can be pointing to take your pictures, the better. Um, and then it's also thinking about things like um, these filters, the wavelengths that we're observing in. It'll observe in one wavelength bin for a while, and then it'll switch filters and observe in another one. So it might want to go back and cover the same area it already covered. Um, and so this algorithm is really what's driving the telescope. And that's another difference between our observatory and some other observatories you might hear about is that we are just doing this survey. So it's not I, astronomer, get to propose for time to look at the thing that I'm interested in. It's much more like, here is the data we're taking, and these are the qualities we expect it to have. So it's just a different way of collecting data, both have pluses or minuses, but this is the survey as we're conducting it. And this goes on for, I think, a full hour. Like, you can just watch the whole simulation, but we're not going to do that. Um, the final component of the survey is that it's deep. Um, and so that's also sort of twofold. The mirror itself, the telescope is large, and so it can collect more light at any given time, and so it can see more of the sky. So each picture already gets a lot of light. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that we're a survey that's already planned to be run for 10 entire years. And so what that also does is every time you revisit a patch of the sky, you can start adding those images together and looking for deeper, deeper into the universe for fainter and fainter things. And so this is SDSS, the Sloan, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, a transformational survey for astronomy, um, and a particular field, cosmos, that it was pointed at and what it observed. Um, and this is what our telescope is expected to find by the end of the survey. And so just having the mirror as large as we have, how often we revisit each part of the sky, and the fact that we'll be doing that for 10 years, we're really going to be 
um, finding some of the faintest stars and galaxies in the universe um, in the entire sky. Remember, there's also the wide part of the survey. Um, so this wide, fast, deep survey design ultimately leads to data unlike anything that astronomy has ever really seen before. And so this is a picture of the southern sky up close to where the Rubin Observatory will be. Each of these red circles in the picture contains 10 million galaxies, um, and we're going to do the whole sky. So we're observing the southern sky about 1,000 times over 10 years. Um, and in general, on a given day, we're going to be generating something like 20 terabytes of data. And by the end of the 10-year the survey, we're going to have 15 petabytes. Um, so it's just an absolutely insane amount of data. Um, so like my computer, for example, has about a terabyte of storage. Um, and so it actually poses this interesting problem of it's amazing that we're taking so much data, but like, how do you process that much data? Like my computer literally cannot do it. Um, and so this is a big shift as well for both the astronomy community and the way the observatory is operating in that we're not just thinking about what is the building and how are we taking the data, we're also really thinking about how are people actually going to use the data? There's so much of it that we can't just expect people to do what they've always done to go in and like download a bunch of stuff that they're interested in and look at it on their computers. And so instead, the observatory right now in construction is investing a lot of time and energy into thinking about how can we automate this and make it so that the data is accessible to the scientists. And so um, the data management team is coming up with a whole bunch of code to automatically process every image that comes off the telescope. And they'll be measuring objects, uh, positions, brightnesses, size, and shapes, and putting them into catalogs for people to use. And so that way, I don't need to be able to go in and look at these huge images and say, wait, where's the galaxy that I'm looking for? Like, we'll have already done a lot of that work. Um, so by the end of the survey, we think we expect to have about 40 billion objects in our catalogs. And obviously, that's more humans than there are on the Earth. And so like literally every person can have their own galaxy. There's enough of them. Um, and a great thing about it is that all the code is open source. So anyone can go in and make any sorts of changes that they want. Um, and what is exciting is that it's not just even the code or the catalogs, but we're also providing actual resources for people to use. So like I mentioned, my computer is definitely not enough to be able to work with this data. So instead of expecting people to have their own infrastructure, we have a whole computing system that people can log in and actually just use our computing resources and access the data as we store it. And so it also makes it a lot more inclusive of a science community. It's not you're at a fancy school that has that can download the whole data set for you. It's now literally anyone can log in and access the data. Um, and just to highlight some of the challenges that go into that, it's already a lot just based off the sheer number of things that we're talking about. Um, but in terms of actually thinking about how do you catalog every object in these images, it's really challenging to do, especially in fields like this one towards the galactic bulge, um, which is very crowded. Um, so you can see an image of all of the stars on the left. And even if we zoom in onto that orange square on the right, and where you're starting to see maybe actual pixels in this image, like. For a lot of these, how do you tell where one star starts and the next one begins? It's this tricky computational problem. And this is just one of the many sorts of challenges that the data management team is figuring out right now in construction that maybe when the survey starts, we're ready to go and start producing this information into catalogs for everyone. Okay, so I'm gonna take another pause here because that's what I wanted to say. So now we've covered What's the observatory that we're building and what's the survey that it's conducting? Um, so before I move on to what we're actually trying to learn from the data, I wanted to stop and take some questions if there were any. So Lauren, it's uh, Mox here. Is, so the compute resources are at back in Arizona at the university? Um, so they're not at Arizona. They've been moving around a lot. I believe now they've settled that a lot of the resources are going to be coming from Slack, which is a Department of Energy um, site uh, out in California near Stanford. And then there's a team of people that will be assembled to continue to process and build that out. Yeah, that's right. So right now they're building a lot of the the processing code and they're testing it all out on um, simulated data and then into operations there'll be a whole team that does the data analysis. 
that'd be interesting. Yeah. And it's this combination approach of every night we're taking data, but then also every year we're going to add all of that data together, like I was talking about, and have a full data release. Of like, and we're going to do that every year for the 10 year survey. So that's one of the huge things that we'll be delivering to the community every year is this updated catalog of data and information. So. Laura, I think I remember reading about this data analysis system a couple of years ago and that it's really the first of its kind in terms of the, the amount of data that it's going to process and the way that it's going to be processed. Um, and so you mentioned briefly about how this is really changing the way that, that astronomers are processing data, but it seems like there are potentially going to be applications like well beyond astronomy that may come out of the design and, and use of this type of data processing system. Has that been um, like discussed at all or thought through? Yeah, I think so. Um, a few things are coming to mind. Um, we definitely think in terms of helping, especially young scientists develop those sorts of skills because you're right, they will be applicable, not even just to astronomy, but I'm thinking of a lot of different um, just private industries. So like Google's interested in these sorts of things, Amazon, these companies that also have huge amounts of data and they're also trying to, to mine it and learn from it. And then in terms of other fields in science, yeah, I could definitely imagine there's a lot of image processing that's similar to neuroscience and things and just the amount of data you can generate in different biological studies as well, for sure. So. Um, but yeah, I think this is definitely the way we're moving towards instead of having to really have your own computer to do things, you can just access this whole bank of computers that are somewhere else. And can I ask is, so as the survey looks at the same area of the sky over time, you mentioned that the images become deeper because you can identify more objects. And I assume as well, you can see changes in the objects and with yes. the data processing, I take it be able to identify those kinds of changes. Yep. Yeah. That's the next thing I'm going to talk about for sure. So, cause that's definitely one of the huge goals of why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. So. Okay. Well with that, I think I will move into my next topic then since you've already, uh, you've already guessed it. So I want to talk about there's the amount of questions we can answer about astronomy with this survey or more than I can begin to talk about. And so what I've done is I've picked four that sort of really, drive why are we building this wide, fast, deep survey. Um, and so the number one reason, the one that I'm particularly excited about is this idea of the changing sky. Um, so my background is as an extra galactic astronomer and things in galaxies are incredibly slow. You're like, oh, it happened very recently. It was only 5 million years ago. And that's still, still not a, a change that we can probe that easily. But there are plenty of things of the sky that change on the order of days, hours, weeks, um, as opposed to millions of years. So for example, supernovae go off and then get dimmer on the span of you know, tens to hundreds of days. Um, AGN, supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies, um, accrete gas and give off light and flicker in really interesting ways. Um, there's actual stars that vary in brightness because of different things that are happening to them. And the thing that I'm most excited about with our observatory is that because we're doing this in sort of an agnostic way, we're literally just looking at everything all of the time. We really don't even have any idea of what we might be able to discover. And that's just really exciting. It's like we, it's yet to be known all of the things that we're going to be able to find. And so how exactly does that sort of process work? And it's related to this idea of the survey being wide and the survey being fast and the deepness also helps too. Um, so over the span of the first year of the survey, we're going to build what we think of as a reference image. So all of those images that we're taking of the same part of the sky, you add them together and you're sort of getting a sense of what the average sky looks like for that single pointing of the telescope. Um, and so on the left here, you see this reference image and there's this, this host galaxy that we can see in the picture. And then every night, if we happen to go back to that part of the sky, I'll say like, okay, here's our new image from today. And it doesn't necessarily look like anything changed if you just look at that picture. But then what we do is we say, okay, here's my new image. And here's what I sort of assume is the, the average picture. And you actually just subtract them. Um, and the differences that remain are things that have actually changed in the sky since you built that reference image. 
And so this is how we can identify if things like get brighter, but also get dimmer. The subtraction works both ways. Um, and so in doing this, you know, again, it's this agnostic process. We're not looking for anything in particular. We're going to subtract all of the images and really identify every single thing that's changing. And so why it helps here, because the more places in the sky that you're doing this, the more things you're going to find that have changed. Um, and the fast is also important because if this supernova went off and we see it, and then we don't look at the same patch of sky until you know, 7, 10, 14 days later, then maybe it's gone by then. Maybe we don't even see it again. And so you're really limiting how many, like what you can find if you don't go back to the same part of the sky very often. So the fact that we'll go back to the same part of the sky roughly every three days means we actually have a really good shot of actually not just finding these things, but also being able to track how they get brighter and dimmer. Um, and so this is just a, a schematic of all the different things that could be changing in the sky, but it's definitely not complete because what we're expecting to see is roughly 10 million objects change brightness per night. Um, so it's crazy. There's a big survey happening right now called the Zwicky Transient Factory that's doing something similar to this survey, just on a much smaller scale. And they're detecting 100,000 things a night. So this is really a, a step up in the amount of variation we can detect in the sky. So this is how we're catching the universe in action. Um, and another thing that's really cool about this is that it's not like we're taking all of these things and then you know three months later we get around to doing the subtraction and finding things. Um, that subtraction is happening essentially instantaneously. Like we're literally taking the picture, doing the subtraction, identifying the things that have changed and sending out what we're referring to as alerts all within under a minute. So every time it takes a picture, it's going to be sending out these alerts. And that's really important because say you are an astronomer who is interested in a specific kind of object, but every three days still isn't enough coverage for you. You would rather be looking at it every night. Or say you have a different telescope and you don't just want to take a picture of something, you want to take a spectra. Having been told that these things are going off in real time, you can schedule those sorts of follow-up observations and actually just learn a lot more about all of these objects that we're going to find. And so it's a way to help the rest of the community do some of the follow-up work that we can't do because of the way we've designed our survey. So it's definitely going to be this interesting uh, collaboration between us and a bunch of other telescopes that are going to want to follow up on these objects. Um, so it's not just things that get brighter and then get dimmer that we're going to be able to find. Another big area of interest for the telescope is cataloging the solar system. So uh, asteroids in particular are a little bit different. They're, like I said, they're not necessarily getting brighter and dimmer as quickly. What they're doing instead um, is they're moving. And so we're actually gonna be able to find objects that are moving across pictures in the sky as well. Um, so this is a single asteroid you can see because again, we're looking every three days, you can sort of track the way the asteroid is moving. Um, and again, the fastness comes into this and it's important because just because you see something move once between two different pictures doesn't mean you have any sort of idea where it's going to go next. You can make some guesses like, yeah, we think this is the orbit it's probably on, but like, is it going to go straight? Is it going to go down a little bit? Is it going to go down a lot? You don't really know. Um, and so following up very often helps you make sure that like, oh yes, no, like this is definitely the object that I'm tracking. I can see it move along this orbit that I've predicted. Um, if you don't go back often enough, maybe you'll skip all of that and be like, oh, is that something new? Is that that thing I saw before? I don't know. And so our survey is going to be able to do a better job at actually tracking these asteroids. Um, so in general, um, the LSST will measure properties of something like 10 to 100 times more objects than are currently available that we know of. Um, and so that's really going to help us gain new insights into how planets form and evolve, but also just what does our own solar system look like? Um, and so in the upper right here, I've listed some just raw numbers of the things that we're going to find. So around 5 million main belt asteroids, 40,000 Kuiper belt objects, these small objects at the furthest edge of the solar system. Um, and a particular science goal that we were interested in is being able to find asteroids as small as say 140 meters in diameter, as far away as the main belt. So that's between Mars and Jupiter. Um, and we're going to be able to catalog something between like 60 and 90% of the potentially hazardous asteroids um, of that size are bigger. Bigger things are easier to find. They're, they're brighter. Um, and potentially hazardous just means an object that might have a small chance of impacting the Earth. 
And so just being aware of what is in our solar system neighborhood and what's around us. Um, another science goal of the telescope is to gain a better understanding of dark matter. Um, so this is where Vera Ruba comes back in. She did observations that are different than what our telescope is going to do, but I like to talk a little bit about her and the big advancement she made for the field. Um, so what Vera did is she looked at a whole sample of galaxies and tried to really figure out like, how are they moving and are they moving in a way that we expect them to? And so if you start with gravity as we understand it because of Newton, because of Einstein, if you look at a galaxy and you start in the very center of the galaxy, um, stars have a certain velocity inside of there. And as you move out, um, there are more and more stars inside the galaxy. And so the stars move faster and faster. There's more mass, there's more gravity to pull them. And then as you get to the outskirts of galaxies, there isn't that much more stuff inside of them anymore. Um, so the gravity that they're feeling actually becomes less and less as you get further and further away and you expect them to start moving more and more slowly. And so you would get the shape of where the speed goes up and then it comes back down. And that's, that would be true. That's the expected motion if the stars are all of the mass. Um, but what Vera found and what we found time and time again since then is that that's not what the stars do at all. And it's also not what the gas does. When you look at it, it starts to move faster and faster and then it never really slows down. It sort of flattens out. This example here on the left, it gets a little bit faster. Um, and on the right is actually a plot from one of Vera Rubin's papers. Um, and so really the power of what she did was making this measurement, but also measure, making it for a larger number of galaxies. And so that also sort of ties back into what we're doing. One, you can explain away, but once you have a whole population of things, now you have to really start taking it seriously. So this was some of the strongest first evidence for the theory of dark matter. I um, mean, for our telescope, that's related to the survey. Um, in a, a number of ways, um, but one good way to think about is dark matter sort of sets the overall structure of the universe. So how do we expect galaxies to be distributed in space and in time? Um, and so the galaxies form these filaments. We can see them now in the galaxies that we detect. Um, and the brightest galaxies you can sort of see here um, and the dimmer ones live further out and we call them voids, just these darker and more empty regions. Um, and that's all related to the dark matter as well. And so the idea is, is that, okay, it's easy to see the bright ones and those seem to do what dark matter would say that they would do. But the more interesting questions come from the smaller galaxies, the fainter galaxies, the ones that live in these less dense regions. And those are the ones that are harder to find unless you have a survey like ours where it's very wide. You're seeing a lot of the sky, a lot of the structure and very deep. You can actually go and find these faint galaxies and see if they're distributed the way dark matter says they should be. Um, and then finally, what we're trying to do is to think about our own Milky Way, the galaxy that we live in, we, like actually mapping it out. Where are the stars in the Milky Way? Um, and to understand how those stars are distributed, what that means about how the galaxy formed and evolved. Um, so this is a simulation from my research group. I'm actually a theorist. I don't even use telescopes for my own research. I just think they're really cool. Um, and so this is an example of a Milky Way-like galaxy forming in our simulations. On the left, it's the gas in the galaxies. On the right, it's the stars. Um, but the way that we think galaxies form and evolve is that smaller galaxies form first, and then they merge together to form bigger galaxies like the Milky Way. And when they do this, these smaller galaxies are falling into the bigger galaxy. And a lot of times they get torn apart in these sort of really dramatic ways. So the stars and the smaller galaxies get pulled out into these really long streams where they can form these sort of shells of stars around galaxies. And, then, and by understanding all of that structure, you can recreate like what kind of galaxy would have fallen in to create that shell or create that stream. And so you can get a sense of how the galaxy build, built up over time. Um, and there's some good examples of this already. Um, so this is again from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It's a picture that's frequently referred to as the field of streams. Um, and it's showing a lot of the northern sky. Um, and you can see some of these streams. We were looking at a galaxy sort of from the outside. This is out now us looking out at our own Milky Way, seeing these sorts of streams in stars. Um, and so there's this big one across the bottom, it's the Sagittarius stream, and there are all these other ones as well. Um, and so again, like I mentioned, this is from the Northern Hemisphere and LSST and the, the Rubin Observatory will be able to do these sorts of measurements from the Southern Hemisphere as well. And so we can get a sense of how did our galaxy build up 
over time. Um, and what it also means is that the depth and the width of the survey will help us gain a better idea of how often galaxies merge and are creating these structures, um, as well as just the number of small galaxies in general, these fainter galaxies that were harder for us to find, how many of them even exist in the universe. And again, that all also relates back to predictions and our understanding of dark matter. Um, so the, this last part of my talk isn't very long, so I'm just going to go through it and then take questions at the end, which is just what are some things that you all can look forward to from the observatory? Um, so without being explicit about it, I sort of walked through every big subsystem of the observatory. So there's the telescope in sight, the people who are building the actual infrastructure, the camera, the data management team, and then there's my team, which is education and public outreach. And so we're thinking about how can we make this stuff fun and engaging for a non-specialist audience. Um, which is our mission. So which our mission is to offer accessible and engaging online experiences that provide non-specialist access to and context for LSST data so anyone can explore the universe and be part of the discovery process. Um, and the part that I really want to emphasize here is that it's all online and that was important to us because we didn't want to build something that you had to be in Tucson to be able to enjoy or you had to be in Chile. We really wanted this to be open to everyone the same way the telescope is open to everyone. Um, so we're building a bunch of things. Unfortunately, like the actual building itself, our team is still in this sort of construction mode. So we've made a lot of progress. We've like 50 to 75% done building all of these things, but they're not fully there yet, which is very frustrating. We're getting very close. <laughs> um, but we're building a website, which I'm excited about because it's not going to just contain things for you to read. But the idea is that like, we're all used to doing all of these different things on our computer. So why not be able to actually interact with the data itself and not just look at it? So you don't need to like code anything, but you can still like pop things and move things around and rotate them and try and get a sense of how they're all structured. And so all those sorts of interactivities are going to be built into the website. Um, and it's gonna be mobile friendly and have things that can be easily shared with people. Um, so you don't need to be astronomers like to sit at their computers and do work. This is going to be a lot more relaxed kind of experience. Um, we're also building the sky viewer, which I'm pretty excited about. So I've been talking about how great and how wide and deep and beautiful our survey will be. Um, and so we didn't want it to be like, yes, it's enormous. And yet here are each of the images that we've decided you can look at. Um, so instead, what we're doing is we're building this web app where you should be able to go in and actually just see the whole survey, pan around, zoom in on stuff that you're interested in, click on things that will give you more information about and really just be able to go around and decide what do you want to learn about what's in these pictures. Um, and then finally, we're really interested in trying to help promote citizen science. Um, so I've been talking a lot about just the amount of data we're going to generate. Um, even with every astronomer thinking about this data or even with the best algorithms in the world, there are still some problems that are just more easily done with people. People are just better at some things than computers. Um, and there's just so much data that having more people involved is only going to make the science better. Um, so we're partnering with a platform called the Zooniverse. Um, so our projects obviously aren't live yet since the telescope isn't finished, but this is just a screenshot from like a month or two ago of the astronomy projects that were currently live on the Zooniverse. So if participating in that sort of scientific research is something that sounds interesting to you, you can go and get started right now. You don't need to wait for us. Um, and someone mentioned about the schedule. So here's my final slide about that, which is that we were on schedule and now we're behind by something like six months to a year. Um, but you could sort of tell, like I mentioned through my pictures, we have been making progress back on the summit. We are making progress on the dome. We're building the telescope mount all with the proper safety procedures in place. This has now been happening long enough to where we can now develop systems and procedures where people can get back to work slowly um, and still make sure that everyone is safe and able to go home to their families. Um, so a lot of the pictures from the construction, you can look at at gallery.lsst.org. Um, so there's actual like albums with different pictures in it. And every sometimes depends on if they're working or not. There are also webcams where you can actually go in and see them constructing the telescope during the daytime when they're working on it down in Chile. So that's always a fun thing to check in just to remind myself every once in a while, like, yes, it is really happening. Um, and thank you. That's that's what I wanted to say. I hope you all have learned something something somewhat interesting about the observatory and are more excited about the things it's going to be able to do. Uh, thanks so much, Lauren. That was awesome. Um, 
I, I've been um, kind of watching the progress on this telescope for a while now. So um, sorry to hear that it's a little bit behind schedule, but really excited that it's only a year behind schedule. Um, you know, there are other telescopes like the James Webb that are a little bit farther behind than, than just a year. So. Yeah. We're also a bit more lucky in that it's on the ground. So like if something goes slightly wrong, which it won't, but we have, we can fix it if we're not launching it into orbit around the sun. So I give them a little bit of slack of you really want to get that right. <laughs> totally. I, I appreciate their, their patience and diligence as well. Yeah. Um, well, if anybody has any um, questions, um, please, um, please un unmute yourself and ask and um, once we're all questioned out, then we can do the door prizes and uh, raffle drawing. When you mentioned that the uh, telescope will um, help with respect to understanding dark matter, does it, would it have any discoveries in respect of dark energy? Yeah, so that's definitely part of it as well. Um, there's a whole science. So the other thing that's complicated is that we as the project are building the observatory and then there are science collaborations that are really formulating all of their science questions. So there's one called the dark energy science collaboration. And yeah, so that's a combination of different ways to try and measure the expansion of the universe. So they'll be looking at supernovae. They'll be looking at um, this idea of weak lensing and different clustering and how the galaxies cluster in space over time also tells you something about the dark energy and how the universe is expanding. And so those, yeah, those two things sort of go hand in hand. If you're studying the dark matter, you're frequently studying the dark energy. Uh, Lauren, it's Mox. Um, you know, in other fields, especially like in the software sector, when you have online communities and there's a new hot topic mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you get, you know, 12 or 13 interested parties from different parts of the world and they kind of are working on that in real time. And here where you're really producing a new image, what every fourth day, it's a new set of data that comes through. Um, how do you, envi do you envision that occurring where in real time, you'll get groups zooming like this and looking at data and, and going through that. And you, I, how are you anticipating or what are you going to do in terms of data provisioning and things like that to try and assist or you know, encourage or accelerate those types of activities? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think there's definitely going to be how people are going to use the data depends a lot on the science that you're interested in. So there's going to be a lot of people who are more interested in the catalogs of information that we're going to generate every year and the full data processing that we're going to do every year. But there are people who are interested in this transient science who are, who are, who they do really care about what is happening every night at the telescope. And so it's a combination of us doing these alerts, but there are exactly, as you said, this is a hot topic. There's, different um, science teams that are building ways to ingest that alert system and redistribute it back out to people who are interested in it. And so giving them the ability to, so also what we're doing is we're just saying like, look, a thing changed. Um, so what they're doing is adding value and like, well, here's a guess of what we think that thing is. And they'll have different catalogs or here, if you only want to know about things that changed in this part of the sky, because you're interested in this galaxy, like being able to do that sort of filtering. So there are these different software teams that are working together and also competing in order to be able to provide those services to scientists. Cool. Yeah. Be very interesting. Does the camera have a built-in spectrometer? Or is it um, no. So if you have an item of interest, you probably use another telescope to take a spectra. Yeah, so that's where the follow-up um, information becomes important. So the catalogs will be available to everyone. And then if you wanna take a spectra of one of these transients, you can try and use the alerts as they come out to identify objects you might be interested in. Um, but we are just an imaging telescope. I would expect if, if something happens interesting, there's probably, you know, supernova, there might be a number of observatories that would then focus on something you found and try and explore it more deeply. Yeah. And so that's also in addition to these people who are trying to think about these alerts that go out, there's then that next step of how do we take an alert and ident like figure out which of the 10 million things do we want to follow up tomorrow night? 
And so um, they're also doing, people are thinking about how to work in that sort of tandem way as well. A lot of moving parts. <laughs> While you haven't got first light yet, has there been any thought of upgrading the camera in future years? So I'm not certain. My guess is we've thought about how to keep what we're currently building operating as it's been delivered. Um, so like with the mirror, for example, it's out in the sky. Over 10 years, it, it starts to get dirty. The coatings on it start to degrade. So there's all infrastructure actually in the observatory building to be able to resurface and repolish the mirror. Um, and I'm not I'm less certain about the procedures for the camera, um, but my guess is that you know, if one of the CCD stops working, there's ways to take it out and repair it, those sorts of things. But in terms of actual upgrades to it, that I'm less certain about. That might be, it also gets tricky too, because a lot of the depth and the adding that we're doing is easier to do if you're taking data in the same way over time as well. And so um, I think a full upgrade to the camera is likely not to happen until after the survey is over. But definitely making sure it's going to keep performing the same way at, at peak performance the whole time is something that we'll be monitoring. Interestingly, that's also a bigger problem for the space telescopes because they'll design something, say, like JWST 20 years ago. <laughs> and like so much technology has changed in that time, and yet they still can't upgrade everything because the system was built in this very precise way. It's just old at the time that you launch it. <laughs> Um, which is always this weird paradox of just building things in space. You can be a bit more responsive on the ground, which is nice. Of course, it will be a huge step forward for sure. It's going to do really different things and exciting things. So, Lauren, I, I mentioned earlier um, before we started that in my astronomy class this week, we were doing the history of astronomy. And we actually talked a little bit about Vera Rubin and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, if this story isn't accurate, but some research I did suggested that, so during her dissertation, one of the things that she was looking at were um, clusters of galaxies. And at the time that wasn't the commonly held belief that galaxies were, were clustered together. Um, Apparently it was thought that they were more spread out. And so she got a lot of flack for that. And so that after her dissertation, she decided to look at something more mundane, um, the velocity of you know, stars at the outer edges of galaxies, and then discovered dark matter, <laughs> which was anything but mundane. Um, so it, it, was like, it was a cool story that is. Um, and so I was I was excited when when this observatory got named after her for, for those reasons. Yeah, I think because I think something similar also happened once the rotation curve thing started taking off. Like I have a lot of respect for her for understanding how she wanted to do her science. And so she was less interested in working on the thing that was, you know, the most high profile. And she just wanted to be able to do science in the way that she wanted to do it. And so being able to switch and um, it just speaks to her talent as a scientist that she could ask interesting questions about so many different subfields and still make so much progress in them. So, um, yeah, just staying true to who you are as well as doing what you love is so, it's such a great example. Any last questions before we move on with the gore prizes thank you all so much for coming here and listening to me talk about the telescope for an hour i really appreciate it and the questions were great i always i always love doing these kinds of things so thank you for coming yeah thank, thank you, you so much that was great and, yeah. and you're entered to win one of the door prizes so if you have a few <laughs> minutes to stick around you can oh definitely yeah just <laughs> before we change the topic well. <laughs> I'm sure i expressed my my gratitude <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, let's get to those door prizes. And uh, don't worry, those of you who showed up late still got entered. So I've got, um, got everybody's name in the, uh, the jar here. 
So we'll do, uh, do this sticker first. Sorry, my virtual background is doing very weird things with the stickers. <laughs> uh, and the winner of that sticker is Deb Wersch. Thanks for joining us, Deb. That's a woohoo. All right, and we'll do the, uh, the NASA sticker here. By the way, these NASA stickers are compliments of um, retired astronaut Scott Altman, who gave the very first um, Science Speaker Series presentation four years ago. He left about 300 <laughs> of those NASA stickers with us. So they've all been touched by an astronaut. <laughs> Uh, the winner of that sticker is Lauren Corley's. <laughs> you can never have enough NASA stickers. <laughs> Little take home gift, something to remember us <laughs> by. Yay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this uh, Eclipse sticker will go to Mary O'Brien. And now the uh, the eclipse coin that will go to Linda Hanlon. What is she she already log off or she's still with us? She might have already logged off. All right. Oh, we'll that's a forfeit. Down. That's a forfeit. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure that I have her contact information actually. So we should probably draw somebody else just so we can, we can get it you're, away. You're, you're treading on thin ice if you start playing that game. <laughs> we'll just we'll pick a backup. But no, I am um, I'm pretty sure I don't have Linda's uh, contact info. So she watches the recording and sees that she won. Linda, I've got another coin for you. Just send me an email at samuel at wyomingstargazing.org and we'll, we'll get you a coin. But this coin that I have in my hand is going to go to Ian Edwards. There you go. All right. Uh, and uh, one of uh, Mike Adler's eclipse, or excuse me, not eclipse prints, but um, astrophotography prints. We'll go to Deborah Brand. Woo hoo! <laughs> and then uh, finally, uh, for those of you who have purchased raffle tickets uh, for this um, event and for previous events, for another one of Mike's prints, the winner tonight is. Diane Gusslander, and I do have her contact information, so I can get that to Diane. All right, uh, well, that wraps up the uh, door prizes and raffle prizes for this evening. Uh, I did want to share my screen with you one more time before we go, um, because one of the things that Wyoming Stargazing is doing this month in honor of um, Women's History Month is each day we're highlighting um, one woman in the history of astronomy. So all um, astrophysicists who have made significant contributions uh, to the field of astronomy, um, dating back to um, ancient Greece, actually. The, the very um, first woman astronomer that we highlighted was Hypatia of Alexandria, who was one of the heads of the, um, the academy. Uh, and then was later, unfortunately, murdered by um, a mob. Um, but anyways, uh, every day on our Instagram um, uh, channel and as well as on Facebook, we've got um, some information about um, one of the incredible um, women astronomers over the past couple hundred years. And Vera Rubin uh, is one of those. Um, I think she'll be up uh, next week or the following week. Uh, so definitely check those out. Um, it was a lot of fun doing the research for that. I had heard of, of many of, um, of these astrophysicists 
astrophysicists before, um, but also I hadn't heard of several of them. So um, really good history lesson for me as well. Um, so check that out if you're interested. And um, I hope to see you all again soon for another World Above the Teton speaker series. Um, again, thanks so much for being here and have a great evening. Thanks, um, thanks Dr. Corliss. Really appreciate yeah. it, it was great. Thank you. It was everyone. great, thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Sam. Thank you.